Here in America, there is a shadowy clandestine network manning the political, socioeconomic, and cultural levers of our society. They hide in plain sight, but dismiss any inkling of the fact that they are indeed the appointed rulers of America from behind the scenes. For example, J.P. Morgan is falsely recorded in history as having been the wealthiest banker who saved the U.S. economy after the Panic of 1907. Nothing could be further from the truth. J.P. Morgan was a puppet to the Rothschild banking cartel. If you do a little research, you'll find this out to be true. It's not what they teach you in school in those history books. It's omitted. But it is nonetheless true, verifiable, and accurate. J.P. Morgan was a puppet to the Rothschild. He died. Everyone was so surprised because the sheeple back then were really, really asleep. And they couldn't believe that Morgan was really not as wealthy as... Uh, as his image was, because the money was the Rothschild money behind him. You know? And that whole idea of the 1907 panic was to bring about the reasoning for a control of the... to, to make sure that there's a stable economy and that there's no more uh, recessions and depressions and all these things and to, to stabilize the economy, and they created the Federal Reserve Crime Syndicate and the Waffen SS Internal Revenue Savages. That's what we got. And as you know, in 20 years, you, maybe you're not even aware, in 20 years, the U.S. government was bankrupt, and we had to uh, give up all of our gold to these criminals uh, that, we've, that put us in debt, like the nation killers that destroy nations, the IMF Bank and the World Bank. They... they in, they, they give impossible loans to pay off, like they've done to us. I mean, the Federal Reserve has enslaved us by creating money out of thin, or, thin air that we pay them interest on, uh, on every dollar that they print. It's unbelievable that the people haven't risen up against this and called for the, called for the uh, execution of these criminals. These people should, they're, they're traitors. Try them, find them guilty, because they are. You open up the books, they're dead. They never get hurt, the establishment, because they have the power, or the perceived power, because we give them the power. We give these criminals the power. Here in Bridgeport, Connecticut, a mayor went to jail for seven years for embezzling money from Bridge, the town of the city of Bridgeport. They re-elected him this last Tuesday. How stupid can these people be? Our leaders in business and politics are merely figureheads, ladies and gentlemen, puppets of their owners who operate behind the scenes, from many avenues behind the scenes, in many different secret organizations that work together. This is covered in Carol Quigley's book, Tragedy and Hope, regarding the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, and this other secret societies such as the Skull and Bones. But when you have situations like Gates and Buffett are pro propagandized as the wealthiest people on the planet, it's laughable when Evelyn de Rothschild and other Illuminati financiers and central bank owners are trillionaires, these people that have bankrupted all the countries. that I just went the list, like Argentina, Zimbabwe. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's a huge list. Like the United Nations makes peace by creating war and conflict, and they claim to be peaceful. There's been more war since they've been trying to end war than there was when it was left alone, because they stir the pot. War is big business. It is part of the Skull and Bones network, as we will soon see. Very clearly and very accurately. So yet another deception that we have here with these globalists, these New World Order Illuminati bankers who are the wealthiest people in the world, the individuals, but they have their puppets, their figureheads that work for them with their frauds, global warming, vaccines to help the children in Africa. You see how they all pull together on, these, on the agenda, the Illuminati agenda, which is the exact agenda of the Communist Manifesto, and make no doubt about it, read the Communist Manifesto and the Ten Planks to Communism, 
and you will find this is America. We already have it. They just haven't put down the, the iron tyranny hasn't come down, the iron fist of tyranny that uh, Stalin and others have done. But it will come as soon as they have full control and full uh, power and all of their minions in place, it will start. And the people will submit or be killed. Stalin did it. And those people that brought the leaders to power in the past, because the past, if you don't remember the past, you will certainly repeat it, you're condemned to, that these criminals, these genocidal maniacs, all were supported to the end, till they got into power. Then they killed all the people around them. Stalin did it, Lenin did it. They called it, oh, they were paranoid. They're not paranoid. That's, the, that's what they do. That's the agenda. They're Freemasons, all of them. By the way, Stalin, FDR, and Churchill were all Freemasons. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Then you read about Albert Pike and this letter in 1871 talking about the three world wars. And the third world war is going to be against the Jews and political Zionism, not the Jews, because it's political Zionism. Zionism and Judaism are um, in, in direct opposition. They are, they are uh, not the same. In fact, uh, they are diametrically opposed. The state of Israel is an arm of this cartel, the New World Order, Illuminati. Um, and they use anti-Semitism as a tool to further their destruction and destabilization of the Middle East through secret means, such as the partnership with the CIA and the MI6, and, of course, the Mossad. This is the truth. This is all what's happening. You know, like the Wizard of Oz, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain when the man behind the curtain is holding the puppet strings. You know, that's the thing. Nobody pays attention to who's really behind all of this. George Soros, sure. Clearly. But they never see Rothschild. Do they? Or Rockefeller. Do they? Or many of the others. The Illuminati bloodline families. They're not all... Uh, key players, but they're all involved. There are 15, it could be argued, 17 families. And all these families I mentioned are part of it. The Secret Origins of the Skull and Bones. In 1996, uh, Chris Milligan produced an incredibly well-researched and accurate account of the Skull and Bones Brotherhood of Death that I personally verified is true and accurate. And here is uh, that account along with some of my own commentary. The Secret Origins of Skull and Bones begins at Yale, where three threads of American and social history, espionage, drug smuggling, and secret societies, interwine into one. A statue of Nathan Hale stands at an old campus at Yale University. There is a copy of that statue in, fr uh, in front of the CIA's headquarters in Langley, Virginia. Yet another stands in front of the Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts, where George H.W. Bush, class of 48, went to prep school and joined a secret society at age 12, the Demolay Society. Each and all of these societies have degrees of initiation requiring sacred oaths and allegiances that rule above all other oaths to marriage, to office, you starting to understand? They groom these people that go up. Uh, Clinton was a GMLA. Um, there is always a secret society connection to all of that. Bill, Bill Clinton. To all of these. Um, it's Masonic origins. It's what it is. The, it's, it's, the secret societies have flourished through Freemasonry. They've been, they, they've been hidden by Freemasonry and utilized, and integrated. Elihu Yale was born near Boston, educated in London, and served with the British East India Company, eventually becoming the governor of Fort St. George, Madras, in 1687. He amassed a great fortune from trade and returned to England in 1699. Yale became known 
As quite a philanthropist, upon receiving a request from the collegiate school in Connecticut, he sent a donation and gift of books. After subsequent bequests, Cotton Mather suggested the school be named Yale College in 1718. Now, Nathan Hale was the only operative to be ferreted out by the British, and after speaking his famous regrets, he was hanged in 1776. Ever since the founding of the Republic, the relationship between Yale and the intelligence community has been unique. In 1823, Samuel Russell established Russell and Company for the purpose of acquiring opium in Turkey and smuggling it to China. This is all on record. It's true. Russell and Company merged with the Perkins of Boston. It's a syndicate that they put together in 1830 and became the primary American opium smuggler. That's right, there was plenty of opium going through America. Again, they don't want to talk about that too much. They talk about the Chinese opium thing. Well, that's where they made the money, but there was, there was opium issues here as well. There was definitely smuggling going on here, and they were behind the entire opium wars. Okay, they were involved. Now, many of the great American and European fortunes were built during this period of time in the opium trade, and Skull and Bones was formed out of this wealth. One of Russell & Company's chief operations in Canton was Warren Delano, sound familiar? Junior, grandfather of Franklin Roosevelt. Other Russell partners included John Cleve Green, who financed Princeton, Abiel Lowe, who financed the construction of Columbia, Joseph Coolidge and the Perkins, Sturgis and Forbes family, you know, the Forbes magazine. Coolidge's son organized the United Fruit Company. Archibald Coolidge was a co-founder of the Council on Foreign Relations. You know, the book written by General Smedley Butler revealing the uh, fact that war is a racket, talked about United Fruit Company in the 20s, the 1920s, um, of the government, actually the army, being the arm of the Fruit Trust. You know, they were down there in uh, South America and elsewhere to protect the fruit interests, the interests of the, you know, to, of the Fruit barons, Coolidge and the Rockefellers were in, they had their fingers dipped in everything at that point, too. Oil interests as well. You should read that book, too, by Smedley Butler, War is a Racket. He was approached by these same people, this, these same secret societies right here, to have a coup, a fascist coup, to take over the government in 1937, I believe it was, or six. Look it up. It's true. Fascist takeover. And he, instead of going along with it, he was supposed to lead a, an army of 500,000 men and basically have overthrow the United States government. But instead of going along with it, he, he, went, he railed against it. And he exposed these criminals for who they are. And it's the same bankers that I'm talking about. These Federal Reserve criminal bankers. Because they want, they want totalitarian socialism. They want... Stalin squared, but they want you to enjoy it, and they're making you enjoy it by giving you all of these these seductive and distracting and um, euphoric distractions and deceptions, so that you're enjoying your life as they take your freedom, your wealth, your dignity, you think everything's just, oh, fine. Oh, it happens. You know, the old adage is, uh, when your neighbor's out of work, it's a recession. When you're out of work, it's a depression. Well, think of the same thing. You know, as you're losing your rights left and right, ah, it's somebody else's problem. I don't worry about it. I don't, have, I don't need a gun. I don't have guns. I don't want a gun. Oh, I, or any of these other things. Well, when you need that gun, what do you do? What happened in the 1991 uh, riots in L.A.? Everyone, all these actors, these liberal actors, anti-gun people, were running to Charlton Heston's house to protect themselves, and they wanted to borrow guns from him. 
See, it's only until you need the things that keep you free that uh, you realize how much you've lost. And one day, this nation is going to have a tremendous wake-up call. I don't know how it's going to come about or where it's coming about or if it's going to be financial or if it's going to be social, you know, the, the, the constant rabble-rousing, this, this, you know, putting, pitting the, this racial war, all these reasons to get martial law so they can suspend the Constitution. They hate the Constitution. Read a book by Colonel Mandel House. Goes right into it. It discusses the, 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 the plan. Philip Drew. Read it. You must. You must see what's happened and the reason why things are going the way they're going today. And it goes down to this skull and bones. It goes right here. Now, one of the great deceptions is that this is a German Illuminati organization. So the, the Thule Society and the Skull and Bones, the rise of Hitler and all of that, they were all connected. Uh, it was the same secret society. That's why Prescott Bush, the Bush family are, are Skull and Boners, were helping the Nazis because it is the same brotherhood, the Skull and Bones. They put the Skull and Bones, the Nazis, the SS, on their uniforms. It's the same order. It's just a different lodge, looking at that way. It's like Freemasonry. Well, it's this Luciferian brotherhood of death. It's the same thing. Working for the same goals. This new world order, this new Atlantis. It's the truth. Have you heard of the Hegelian dialectic? Well, guess what? Just guess what happened. Let's, let's look at this. William Huntington Russell, class of 33, 1833. Samuel's cousin. Studied in Germany from 1831 to 32. Germany was a hotbed of new ideas. The scientific method was being applied to all forms of human endeavor. Prussia, which blamed the defeat of its forces by Napoleon in 1806 on soldiers only thinking about themselves in the stress of battle, took the principles set forth by John Locke and Jean Rousseau and created a new educational system. Johann Fitch, in his address to the German people, declared that the children would be taken over by the state and told what to think and how to think. A hundred years before Hitler, George Frederick, George Wilhelm Frederick Hegel, or Hegel, the Hegelian dialectic, this guy, took over Fitch's chair at the University of Berlin in 1817 and was a professor there until his death in 1831. Hegel was the culmination of the German idealistic philosophy school of Immanuel Kant. To Hegel, our world is a world of reason. The state is absolute reason, and the citizen can only become free by worship and obedient worship and obedience to the state. Hegel called the state the march of God in the world and the final end. This final end, Hegel said, has supreme right against the individual, whose supreme duty is to be a member of the state. Both fascism and communism have their philosophical roots in Hegelianism. Hegelian philosophy was very much in vogue during William Russell's time in Germany. When Russell returned to Yale in 1832, he formed a senior society with Alfonso Taft, class of 33. According to information acquired from a break into the tomb, the Skull and Bones Meeting Hall, in 1876, Bones is a chapter of a core of a German university. General Russell, its founder, was in Germany before his senior year and formed a warm friendship with a leading member of a German society. He brought back with him to college authority to found a chapter here. So class valedictorian William H. Russell, along with 14 others, became the founding members of the Order of the Skull and Bones, which was first written Skull, S-C-U-L-L, -L, and later changed to the Order of Skull and Bones with the proper spelling. The secretive Order of Skull and Bones exists only at Yale. Fifteen juniors are tapped each year by the seniors to be initiated into next year's group. Each initiate is given $15,000 and a grandfather clock. Far from being a campus funhouse, the group is geared more towards the success of its members in the post-collegiate world. They make these people become leaders. 
in industry, politics, and of course, intelligence, and war, military. The family names on the Skull and Bones roster roll off the tongue like an elite party list. Lord, Whitney, Taft, Jay, Bundy, Harriman, Weyerhaeuser, Pinchot, Rockefeller, Goodyear, Sloan, Stimson, Phelps, Perkins, Pillsbury, Kellogg, Vanderbilt, Bush, Lovett, and on and on. William Russell went on to become a general and state legislator in Connecticut. How interesting, right? What a coincidence. Alfonso Taft was appointed U.S. Attorney General Secretary of War, a post many bonesmen have held, ambassador to Austria, and ambassador to Russia, another, held, another post held by many bonesmen. His son, William Howard Taft, class of 87, is the only man to be both President of the United States and Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. I mean, we're talking, these people are in the highest positions of power. Now, the order flourished from the very beginning, in spite of occasional squalls of controversy, there was dissension from some professors who didn't like the secrecy and, and exclusiveness uh, of their order. And there was a backlash from students showing concern about the influence Bones was having over Yale finances and the favoritism shown to these Bonesmen. In October of 1873, Volume 1, Number 1 of The Iconoclast was published in New Haven. It was, the only, it was only published once and was one of very few openly published articles on the Order of Skull and Bones. And I quote from The Iconoclast, we speak through a new publication because the college press is closed to those who dare to openly mention Bones. Out of every class, Skull and Bones takes its men. They have gone out into the world and have become, in many instances, leaders in society. They have obtained control of Yale. Its business is performed by them. Money paid to the college must pass through their hands and be subject to their will. No doubt they are worthy men in themselves, but the many whom they look down upon while in college cannot so far forget as give money freely into their hands. Men in Wall Street complain that the college comes straight to them for help instead of asking each graduate for his share. The reason is found in a remark made by one of Yale and, Amer Yale and America's first men. Quote, Few will give but bonesmen, and they care far more for their society than they do for the college. Year by year, the deadly evil is growing. The society was never as obnoxious to the college as it is today. And it is just as this ill feeling that shuts the pockets of non-members. Never before has it shown such arrogance and self-fancied superiority. It grasps the college press and endeavors to rule it all. It does not design, excuse me, it does not deign to show its credentials, but clutches at power with the silence of conscious guilt. To tell the good which Yale College has done would be well nigh impossible. To tell the good she would do yet more and difficult. The question then is reduced to this. On the one hand lies a source of incalculable good. On the other, a society of guilty, a society guilty of serious and far-reaching crimes. I mean, it's unbelievable. It is Yale College against Skull and Bones. We ask all men as question of right, which should be allowed to live? Well, we could see what happened. Um, this is in 1873. You know, at first the society had hired halls when they had meet, met. Then the tomb was was created or, or was built in 1856. A vine-covered windowless brown stall hall was constructed where the bonesmen to, to this day hold their strange occultish initiation rites and meet each Thursday. So, that was one example of exposing the Skull and Bones. On September 29th, 1876, a group calling itself the Order of File and Claw broke into the Skull and Bones Holiest of Holies. In the tomb, they found Lodge Room 324, fitted up in black velvet, even the walls being covered with that material. Upstairs was a Lodge Room 322, the Sanctum Sanctorium of the Temple, furnished in red velvet with a pentagram on the wall. In the hall are pictures of the founders of Bones at Yale and of members of the society in Germany when the chapter was established in 1832. The raiding party found another interesting scene in the parlor room next to 322. This is from The Fall of the Skull and Bones. Quote, 
On the west wall, hung among old pictures, an old engraving representing an open burial vault in which on a stone slab rest four human skulls grouped about a fool's cap and bells, an open book, several mathematical instruments, a beggar's scrip, and a royal crown. On the arched wall above the vault are the explanatory words in Roman letters. We war der Thor, were Weiser, were Bettler, Oder, Kaiser, in German. And below the vault is engraved in German characters the sentence, Ab arm, ab beich, I'm toad gleich. The picture is accompanied by a card on which is written from the German chapter, presented by D.C. Gilman of D., class of 50. Daniel Coit Gilman, along with other bonesmen, formed a troika which still influences American life today. Soon after their initiation in Skull and Bones, Daniel Gilman, Timothy Dwight, and Andrew Dickinson White went to study philosophy in Europe at the University of Berlin. Gilman returned from Europe and incorporated Skull and Bones as Russell Trust in 1856, with himself as treasurer and William H. Russell as president. He spent the next 14 years in New Haven, consolidating the order's power. Gilman was appointed librarian at Yale in 1858. Through shrewd political maneuvering, he acquired funding for Yale science departments, Sheffield Scientific School. You can see a lot of this global warming crap and all of these scientific theories and the big pharma medical fraud has its roots in the fact that people in the, in the medical community have come out of skull and bones and people in the scientific community have come out of, science, of skull and bones, people in the military, they choose specific people, specific bloodline families as well. It's not a coincidence when you hear that the most of the presidents are, are related by some relation. And then a lot of these famous actors, have, you know, like Reese Witherspoon's great-great-great-great-grandfather, sign the uh, Declaration of Independence, and you'll find this connection with families like the Bacon family, Kevin Bacon and his wife. Both of their families are, are long bloodline families uh, of the establishment of the United States, the, which, which from the beginning occurred with a group of enlightened ones that considered they were deists. You know, a lot of the founding fathers were Satanists even, like Ben Franklin. Okay, this is the truth, but there were also Christians among them, and they're all, you know, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater because there's evil people. There always will be evil. There will be evil even if we defeat the New World Order. Evil will still exist. There's evil every day. Now, there's a tremendous amount of information I could go into. There's books, uh, more, more books. You should, you should read the book, America's Secret Establishment. Anthony Sutton outlined the Order of Skull and Bones' ability to establish vertical and horizontal chains of influence that ensured the continuity of their conspiratorial schemes. Uh, it's on and on and on. It's continuing today. When you look at the things that are happening and the people that are behind the scenes, it always comes back to skull and boners and people that are in, of the influence. And, they, and they're also put into these positions of power. And then those folks in position of power bring in like-minded people from other secret societies. I mean, there are many of them. Scrolling Key. There, there's, a, there's a whole list of them. The, the, Harvard has its its group, but they're all ultra elitists. Now remember that President Franklin Roosevelt's alien property custody, uh, custodian Lee T. Crowley signed vesting order uh, seizing the property of Prescott Bush under the Trading with the Enemy Act on November seventeenth, nineteen forty two. The vesting order number two four eight. The order published in obscure government record books and is kept out of the news. It is hardly ever discussed. Note number four is that explains nothing about the Nazis involved and only that the Union Banking Corporation was run for the Thyssen family of Germany and or Hungary, nationals of a designated enemy country. By deciding that Prescott Bush and the other directors of the Union Banking Corporation were legally front men for the Nazis, the government avoided the more important historical issue. In what way were Hitler's Nazis themselves hired, armed, and instructed by the New York and London clique of what Prescott Bush was an executive manager? New York Times, December 16, 1944, ran a five-page paragraph, excuse me, a five-paragraph page uh, on the actions of the New York State Banking Department. Only on the last sentence does the, is there a reference to the Nazi bank. And it's, 
the Nazi Banking Corporation, which is really what it should have been called, the Union Banking Corporation. 39 Broadway, New York, has received authority to change its principal place of business to 120 Broadway. The Times admitted the fact that the Union Banking Corporation had been seized by the government for trading with the enemy, and the fact that 120 Broadway was the address of the government's alien property custodian. They leave these things out. Since the turn of the century, that would be the 1900s, two investment bank firms, Guarantee Trust and the Brown Brothers, Harriman, were both dominated by members of Skull and Bones. These two firms were heavily involved in the financing of communism and Hitler's regime. Bonesmen share an affinity for the Hegelian ideas of the historical dialectic, which dictates the use of controlled conflict, thesis versus antithesis, to create a predetermined synthesis, a synthesis of making and design, a synthesis of their making and design, where the state is absolute and individuals are granted their freedoms based on their obedience to the state, a new world order. Funding and political maneuvering on the part of Bonesmen and their allies helped the Bolsheviks prevail in Russia. In defiance of federal laws, the cabal financed industries, established banks, and developed oil and mineral deposits in the fledging USSR. Later, Avril Harriman, as minister to Great Britain in charge of Lend-Lease for Britain and Russia, was responsible for shipping entire factories into Russia. According to some researchers, Harriman also oversaw the transfer of nuclear secrets, plutonium, and other U.S. dollar printing plates to the USSR. In 1932, the Union Banking Corporation of New York City had enlisted four directors from the Skull and Bones, class of 17, and two Nazi bankers associated with Fritz Thiessen, who had been financing Hitler since 1924. This is unbelievable, but it's true, and now you can see why things are the way they are. They're going to destroy the Constitution. They want totalitarian socialism. Please check out this incredible article uh, that I posted on my website, howardneeman.com, and share this video with everyone you know. It goes on and on and on. The skull and bones is the root of the American, of the American establishment and uh, the reasons why the world is the way it is today. It is the Illuminati controlling it. Check out all the books that I've been talking about. Also, look at Proofs of a Conspiracy, which was written in 1798 by John Robeson, a professor of natural philosophy at Edinburgh University in Scotland. And he also was a Freemason, and he was asked to join the Illuminati. And after study, he concluded the purposes of the Illuminati were not for him. An association has been formed for the express purpose of rooting out all the religious establishments and overturning all existing governments. The leaders would rule the world with uncontrollable power, while all the rest would be employed as tools of their ambition of their unknown superiors, quote-unquote. Proofs of a conspiracy was sent to George Washington. Responding to the sender of the book with a letter, the president said he was well aware the Illuminati were in America. He felt that the Illuminati had diabolical tenets, and their objective was the separation of the people from their government. In Proofs of a Conspiracy, Robeson printed the ceremony of initiation of the regent degree of Illuminism. It is a skeleton pointed out to him, the initiate, at the feet of which are laid a crown and a sword. He is asked whether that is the skeleton of a king, nobleman, or a beggar. As he cannot decide, the president of the meeting says to him, the character of a being a man is the only one that is of importance. The character of being a man is the only one that is importance. This is essentially the same as the writing in the Skull and Bones tomb. Were war, der Thor, were Weezer, Bettler, Oder, Kaiser, ob arm, ob Reich, I'm Toad Gleich, which reads, Who was the fool? Who the wise man, beggar or king? Whether poor or rich, it's all the same in death. You see, the way they have maintained this control and increased their power over us is through these ploys, Hegelian ploys, and getting people, 15 people per year, specifically chosen for the purposes of the order that they will work to do what they're asked. They swear an oath that goes above any oath that they take as president to their wives to never reveal but always do what the society tells them. They must. They've sworn an oath, a blood oath. Most recently, uh, 
You look to people that have been put in positions of power to influence us. You got Dana Milbank, political reporter for the Washington Post, class in 1990. Paul Giamatti, everyone loves him. Oh my God, he, he came out in that first with, with the Howard Stern movie, playing pig vomit. Then, of course, he played uh, in, the, in the HBO propaganda piece, John Adams. I remember the scene in that. It was amazing. They're going around. There's no more taxation. We're representing. Ah, everyone pays their tax. It's all to people. Like people, There was no personal income tax, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? That's not what they were talking about. Everyone pays their tax. It's all sub, subconscious, subliminal stuff. Many writers have been skull and boners. Screenwriters and such. Um, Paul Giamatti comes to mind um, since he did that. Austin Goolsby. Skull and Bones class in 1991 is the staff director and chief economist of Barack Obama's Economic Recovery Advisory Board. And we wonder why the world is in such economic chaos, why they lie about all of these things, how, how things are getting better as they get worse. Time to wake up, ladies and gentlemen. There's a lot more information here, impossible to cover. It would take hours. But do the research. You know, I, I, I was, I'm trying not to, to put too much information out there because sometimes it, an hour or two hour long presentation, people don't have the patience for. So this is a little shorter than that. But there's so much to cover here and so much truth. Just check out the website. Check out uh, all of my articles that are there on and And take some time to, to, to wake up. Man, this is real. It's happening. They're working together. They're, they're, they swore a blood oath. Just because you like them. They're likable people. I mean, don't be sheeple like these sheep in, 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 in Bridgeport who, after their mayor embezzled money, they, they re-elected him after he'd served seven years in prison. I mean, my God, are we really, as the elite believe us to be, Stakes on the table by choice and consent.